When, when I was a young Anglican, I often wondered why Luke, uh, why Archbishop Cramner presented the two Gospels that he had uh, from last week to this week in the order in which he did, because he goes from 15 and he skips to 19. And there were a number of reasons that jump out at you, but one of the things that becomes clear is that we saw last week the compassion of the Father, the long-suffering and the patience of the Father. And this week, we see an instance, one of only two in Scripture, where it is recorded that Jesus actually wept. So, what's going on? Luke starts this gospel as the continuation of what happened previously, and that was the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Every Jew in Israel was awaiting the arrival of the Messiah the heir to King David's throne. They would have been fully aware of Zechariah's prophecy that the, that the Messiah would arrive on horseback to restore the kingdom, and this event would indicate the presence of the Messiah. They would have known that the, the miracles, the healings, the events that Jesus had been performing in his ministry would have been the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. The Jews have been taught by the prophets, be ready. John the Baptist told them, be ready, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Even Jesus himself told him in a number of parables, be ready. Of any, in, of any pending event in the Jewish mind, the awareness and significance of this particular event would have been uppermost in their consciousness. And Jesus, upon fulfilling this Old Testament prophecy, having ridden into Jerusalem, bringing to fruition hundreds of years of Jewish anticipation, looks at the city of Jerusalem, and he weeps. Why? This was to be a glorious moment. Why? Well, let's look a little bit first at Jerusalem. He had just ridden into the city on a colt. Palms, cloaks had been thrown down before him to pave his ride into the city. The multitudes had just broken out in rejoicing and praise. They were aware that the blind saw, that the deaf heard, that the lame walked, the mute spoke. People were filled with miraculous events, controlled nature. And they say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. There is rejoicing because they see their Messiah coming. And if you'll remember last week, we had a crotchety old big brother, the Pharisees. And they're looking at this event, and they say, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Zechariah's prophecy is being fulfilled. The king has come. The Messiah is present. And their response to these events is, tell your people to shut up. This is reserved for the king. This is reserved for David's son. This is reserved for the Messiah. Who do you think you are? And Jesus looks at them and he says, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And that word in Greek, cry, means literally to scream, to urgently proclaim and demand to be heard. If the people had not expressed their rejoicing in the coming of Jesus in the triumphal entry, nature itself would have had to have screamed that the Messiah was here. 
And let's not miss an obvious fact that we often overlooked. This wasn't some quick, secretive, uh, arcane little event performed by Jesus. And it wasn't something that was only seen by Jesus' most ardent followers. No. This event began on the Mount of Olives. This event could have been seen. Mount of Olives is much closer to Jerusalem than our mountains here. Imagine if you were living at the foot of the San Gabriel Mountains, behind the church. And you had a house at the base of the mountains. And all of a sudden you look up and here's this guy with a bunch of people on this little animal traveling down the mountain. This is the picture. Jerusalem is looking at the Mount of Olives and here comes Jesus down the side. This was a profound and dynamic display of Christ. And he made sure that everybody saw it. Now, he's coming to Jerusalem and we often wonder, where do we see Jerusalem? Well, we've encountered Jerusalem before. We usually just kind of bypass it. In Genesis 14, three verses. I'm just going to read three verses. Beginning at verse 18, Melchizedek. King of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abram, gave a tithe to Melchizedek. Now, it's interesting because Melchizedek's name literally means righteous king. So here is Salem. Here is Abram after he had just been in a major battle with the kings of the east to rescue Lot, who had been kidnapped. And after this war, he comes into this town called Salem, which is a derivation of the Hebrew Shalom. And he meets this king priest of God Most High. And this king priest gives bread and wine to Abel. And for us, every fiber of our being should be shouting. This is a foreshadowing of the Eucharist because Melchizedek is a type of Christ. So this is the first instance we see Salem, Jerusalem, mentioned in Scripture. Now, the next most prominent time we see it is David. And during David's reign, he rescued the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines. It had been captured by the Philistines. And he brings it to a city now called Jerusalem, which literally means city of peace. But we'll get to that in a second. The Ark of the Covenant was, as defined by Scripture, the footstool of the very throne of God. The Ark of the Covenant represented the very presence of God on earth. And David, as presenting the Ark to Jerusalem, brings back the divine warrior. And we'll get to that in a minute. Exodus 15.3 states that the Lord is the warrior of Israel. So here is this little panorama. We have a priest king foreshadowing the Eucharist. We have the Ark of the Covenant representing the presence of God, the footstool of God's throne in this city. And Jesus comes to this city and he weeps. Now, the name literally translates the city of peace, but theologically, when you look at what's going on, it probably is a better rendering to say it is the possession or the foundation of peace. And what we often miss is we think that the peace is a peace from conflict and battle, and it is, but that conflict and battle is not with other armies. It's peace with God. 
There's no fear here. And Jesus comes to this place and sees this city who has, instead of recognizing the connection to Salem, recognizing its history with Melchizedek, recognizing that in the Ark of the Covenant, as it sits in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle and in the temple, that they have the presence of God with them, he sees what? Sin, greed, and apostasy in the money changers. And he weeps. And that's not the only reason Jesus wept when he came to Jerusalem. You come to the temple, Jesus arrives, and he expects to see this glorious worshiping of God, the Ark of the Covenant. In Jewish theology was God's residence. Scripture says that between the cherubim, God hovered. He dwelt. The cherubim extended their arms and had to cast their eyes down because they could not look on the majesty of God. The very presence of God is here. During the wilderness wanderings, this Ark of the Covenant, when the people of God were on the march, the tabernacle would be packed away and the Ark <coughs> would be led out front. It would be placed in front. The king, the warrior king, would lead his nation wherever they were going. And if there was a battle to be fought, it was the Ark of the Covenant that was brought with them in battle so that Yahweh could fight for Israel. This is the significance of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark only appears twice in the New Testament. Once in Hebrews, where it is mentioned in description of Old Testament worship, and marvelously juxtaposed with Christ because Christ is the fulfillment of the Ark of the Covenant. And the second time is in Revelation 11 where it is the Ark that is brought forth in the time of judgment. It is the climactic moment of God's heavenly temple at the end of time where his mobile throne comes down from heaven and the ark is presented to judge the nations. Such was the significance of Jerusalem at the time of Christ. Such was its significance as Jesus understood it. And because Jerusalem was connected with Israel, it is often identified as Zion. It is often identified with the entire nation. So to enter Israel was to enter the nation of God. It was to enter his salvation. And to enter Jerusalem was to enter into all of that. But there's something even more significant about Christ seeing all of this, seeing the rejection of all of this, in this morning's gospel. And, he stay, and in verse 44, Luke presents it and says that Jesus, in the middle of his excoriation of these people, after he had wept, he said, There shall not one stone be left on another, and, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. The time of thy visitation. Now, I'm not a fan of the NIV. Uh, I, I really don't like the translation, but you've got to give the devil its due. And in this particular passage, they do a marvelous job of translating that phrase. That phrase literally should convey this meaning. Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming 
to you. In Scripture, we see two different words that are used, especially in the New Testament, two different use, words that are used for the concept of time. Chronos, which we get chronology or chronometer, the measurement of distinct, discrete moments, seconds, minutes, hours of time. But then there's another word, and it's kairos. And that is usually translated to mean a season or a period of time. It carries with it the idea of being involved in a critical situation which demands a decision. And the decision positively would change one's life for the good, but there also is negative implications in the decision. So when it is used in this sense, it means that there's a suitable period or a right moment to make this critical decision. It is the moment of opportunity. It is the moment of a decisive change. This season now demands action. Now, we talk about season, and it sounds a little bit confusing. Think of it in this sense. When we talk about World War II, we generally don't specifically talk about December 7th, 1941, unless we say December 7th, 1941, and then talk about World War II. No, when we talk about World War II, we're talking about the period of 1941 to 1945. So we're talking about a season. That's the concept that's being communicated here. Jesus is saying, you didn't understand that season. You didn't understand that period of time. All of your history, you've been waiting for this. And here's the moment of decision. You had all of the information that you could possibly have needed. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised. Nature is controlled. Multitudes have been fed. Even Elijah has appeared. And in all of this is the anticipation of my arrival, the moment of all of the hopes and expectations of the history of Israel has come to fruition. The moment of truth, as it were, has arrived. The crisis point, the point of no return, the point to make a decision based on what you know, that all of these things lead up to the coming of the Messiah, and you missed it. And not only that, but for the first time since Eden, God incarnate actually walked among, lived with, he dwelt in the midst of and to fellowship with mankind on earth. And they missed that as well. For all of their history, the Jews worshipped in the tabernacle in the temple, and their high priest would present the sacrifice for sin, allowing fellowship with God, removing the obstacle to fellowship with God. And the high priest would sprinkle the blood of that sacrifice upon the Ark of the Covenant. Imagine the footstool of the very throne of God daily having blood splashed on it. And for all of their history, the Ark of the Covenant, the very footstool of God's presence, of his throne, was the center of their worship, this Ark which King David brought back to Israel and established Jerusalem as the city of peace of the Most High, the city of peace with God, the city where God dwelt, had in their midst the heir of King David, the true king of Israel, who had just announced his arrival, the Messiah. He had just fulfilled Zechariah's prophecy, who himself was the true Ark of the Covenant, Jesus. And they missed that too. The salvation for which Israel had waited all her life was in her midst, and she missed it. Now do you see why Jesus wept? 
I am God. I have done everything to tell you who I am. You've had centuries of the prophets telling you this is what I would do when I came. And I'm here in this season of salvation. You missed it. You missed it. They were waiting for their king to defeat their oppressor. And he did. They were waiting for their Messiah to ride in on a horse, and he did. They were waiting for their God to come and save them, and he will. And they let all of that slip through their fingers. Because they, as we today, didn't recognize what our true enemy was and is. You see, they were expecting a great military battle, standing army against standing army. They were expecting release from bondage. They were expecting a warrior. But there was a great battle. There was. And there was release from bondage. And their enemy was vanquished. And a warrior had arrived. But the battle wasn't against a standing army, but it was against mankind's greatest enemy, death. And the release from bondage was a release from spiritual bondage to sin, the greatest obstacle to fellowship with God himself. And the warrior came. But he came as a lamb. Where do you stand, beloved? When you talk to people now, do you tell them now? Now. Now is the time. Do you tell them, don't let it slip through your fingers? Do you tell them that since the cross of Christ, the eternal clock has been ticking. You don't know when he's going to call you home. You could slip on a piece of ice at a party. Have you let that season slip through your fingers? Because the next time we see Jesus, he will not come as a lamb. He'll come as the warrior lion. And he won't be riding on a small donkey, looking kind of bizarre. But he'll bring with him four devastating horsemen. We call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. When he comes again, he won't be the one to die on the cross. He'll demand all he sees to answer for that cross on which he died. When he comes, will he have that feeling of compassion of the long-suffering father that we saw last week? Will he weep those tears of rejoicing and praise at one lost sheep coming back to him? Or will, be, or the, will the weeping be as it is this morning, a weeping of grief and loss at the knowledge that we didn't recognize the season? Because now is the season. Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation.